Thank you, John. Thank you, Colin. Again, um, quite a hard act to follow from that. Um, and I'm very much going to focus on the sort of Indian side of things. We are indeed all stakeholders in the future of our planet. And so even though tigers and rhinos and elephants seem a hell of a long way from here, uh, we are very much bound up in their welfare and support. So the question we're going to ask tonight, rightly so, is, is there a wild future for tigers? We've heard a lot of uh, ups and downs over the last year, much like the rest of our wildlife habitat around the world. But I'm not actually going to tell you the answer to that uh, um, question until right to the end. Again, you've seen these pictures already uh, from Africa, but we've got the same problem in India. And it's a problem that um, is not going to go away. You know, a tiger's home, the forests, they're under increasing pressure, more and more. 1.3 billion people now need those forests more than ever. And in fact, in India, Colin was talking about 20% of tigers, uh, oh, sorry, 20% of landscape being protected. In India, it's only 1.9%, far below that which is required for their own ecological security. Lots of what looks like forest cover in, in India is in fact not forest cover. It's actually denuded, very denuded landscape. And of course, I learned a lot of this when I spent uh, a whole three months walking the forests, walking the corridors, walking across India in those forests outside of the, the protected areas. And that was you know, wonderful fun and a great excuse. And in fact, Colin helped pay for me to do that. So huge thanks for him for doing that. But it did teach me a huge lesson. We have a major problem in, in India particularly. What are the causes? We all know the causes. You've all heard about them. NGOs talk about them. Poaching, you know, big problem. But we also know that there are solutions out there. Nepal has been extremely successful over the last uh, few years. And we all worry stiff that the army who are there at the moment have been moved now to, uh, to uh, go and help with the earthquake victims and the issues that that might affect in terms of poaching. But it's by no means the only threat. There's lots of tigers being killed by other means. There's a lot of poisoning going on of carcasses when a tiger dies. There's we're finding tigers in water wells, in canals, in a whole variety of other ways. So these are the, the, the tigers killed by unnatural causes. And that is putting a huge strain on the ability. But the reality, and I think this is a, is a major issue, and again, we talk about elephants in the room. This one is a big elephant. This is the cow, the cow, the sacred cow in India. Basically, the cow is grazing the tiger's landscape out of existence. That together with goats. Big, big problem in India. Increasingly, tigers are having to live off cattle. There's no prey left in all these areas. I spent months looking at the ground, trying to find prey species outside of uh, these, these uh, protected areas. And there wasn't much. So what we've got is cattle being taken out all the time now, and we've got a man-animal conflict problem with our present situation in India. But the good news, guys, the good news is tigers are up. Okay? This is government uh, statistics, so you have to take them with a slight pinch of salt, and certainly in the olden days you'd take them with a hell of a pinch of salt. But I think even those who are tiger people here today would probably recognize these figures. Um, the tigers being a, you know, a little bit um, discriminating about those, those figures themselves. But the reality is I think they are up. And I think there is good news. They're up, though, in the protected areas, in the areas in which they've had the greatest security and most effort has gone into them. And dare I say, where most of you and I go to travel to go and see Indian wildlife. What is happening is outside those areas 
we have the massive problem, which historically would have held all those tigers, those great tiger numbers. So we have a, a problem. They're being protected well in small areas, but in the bigger landscape, they are collapsing. So what does one need to have a wild tiger? What does one need to keep it going? Well, of course, you need water, you need prey, you need protection. You need landscape, big landscapes. In fact, a, a male tiger lives in about 100 square kilometers. That's about the size of central London. And he needs a lot of animals to keep him going. He needs 50 hoofed animals to keep him going. Now, that, in reality, doesn't sound too bad. But in reality, in order to sustain those prey species, we really can only afford to take about 10% of those prey species out, so we need 500 animals. But here's the catch. In reality, every male, he has his females in his harem. And he need, they also need, they have 50 animals. So now we're up to a figure of prey species of about 2,500. Spotted deer, samba deer, wild pig and a variety of other animals in those forests to keep them going. So we've got a quantifiably bigger problem. Prey. It's often been said, and then a bit like people would say about the panda, you know, they're not breeding, they can't be doing very well. The reality is they're big cats, and they, they like our, our, our own cats. They'll breed incredibly well. They are prolific breeders. In fact, uh, a wonderful tigress in Pench Tiger Reserve um, some of you might have been there. Actually had five cubs uh, recently. She's just had six, I believe. Um, she's had 22 cubs in the last seven, year, uh, seven years. That's an amazing uh, success rate, of which 15 have survived to adulthood. So she herself has helped create a whole tiger full of parks. The reality, though, is that the greatest scientist in India a gentleman called Ulas Karanth, reckons we could, in fact, have 10,000 to 15,000 tigers in the landscape. So in reality, the, the WWF times two is actually a, a very, very conservative estimate. It is possible, in theory, to actually do much better than that. And I would say that India, in fact, has the resources, it has the skills and the expertise to do that today. We've got some amazing people. So let me l take you through a little story. And I paint this picture with a wonderful creature called Muchley. And I call her one hell of an entrepreneurial cat. She lives in Ranthambore Tiger Reserve. And I'm going to show you a little film of her now.
So I'm now going to talk to you about this lady and what makes her so special and why it's so important. I call it Tigernomics. The reality here is that we've had this amazing boom time in India. And I saw it coming 10 years ago when I founded uh, Tough Tigers. Here was a place that was going to require an immense amount of landscape to handle even a tiny percent of what would be a nature tourism industry. And every Indian has a right to see their own natural heritage. But if there's not very much of it, it's going to be a major problem. And you can see the figures here, just in, the, in, in a few short years in terms of the amount of people going to one single tiger reserve in India. The amazing thing about this wonderful Matchley is that she even has two million people work, walk through her territory every year. Can you believe that? Two million people walk to the middle of the forest to Ganesh Temple every year. She's never touched one single one of them. The reality is this wonderful female is responsible for so much. And this really is about natural capital and, and working out how valuable she is. She's created lodges and services. She's created thousands of jobs. In fact, the last figure I heard was about 4,000 jobs. She gains amazing community support. She even builds hospitals and schools because the people coming to see her. She's one of the great pride and joys of Ranthambo. She's commissioned films and books. She's damn good at what she does. She lives in a very tiny part of Tiger Ranthambo, uh, Ranthambo Tiger Reserve. It's a, about 10 square kilometers. It's the tourism zone. Um, in fact, it's expanded a bit more since then, but it's the reality is that you only ever see a very small part of most tiger reserves as a tourist. But the reality is that fantastic woman, that fantastic female, has generated a most extraordinary amount of money herself. 65 million pounds, I should say, in direct revenue to the parks over the decade of her life. She's still there. She's about 18 years old. She's still on the fringes. Now, this is, this is an entrepreneur. This is the Richard Branson. This is the Sachin Tendulkar of tigers. She is so fantastic. Millions of people depend on one tigers and the rest of her family to see, to enjoy, to experience India as it once was. So the, re the reality of the old adage, if it pays, it stays, is still very prevalent. In fact, we thought in 2010, uh, Richard and I, who's here tonight, thought that in fact we'd give her a lifetime achievement award for the staggering sum. Rather unfortunately, we th the field director thought it was going to him, and he was rather disappointed when we gave it actually to Muchley, so he didn't quite know what to do with the, uh, uh, the Samba deer, her favorite food, when we presented it. But we thought she deserved a lifetime achievement award. So what is the cost of having Muchley, a, a tiger in a, in a park, surrounded by 300,000 people? She's actually estimated it only costing about 1,200 quid per square kilometer. She lives in 10 square kilometers. So her protection costs are relatively small. So let's talk economics. Let's talk return on investment. How's that, Warren Buffett? Okay. It's one hell of a good return on investment. It's not only me that talks about this and has talked about this for 10 years. These creatures are extraordinarily valuable, alive rather than dead. And India has commissioned a huge report just showing how valuable tiger reserves are. This is actually a, an ecosystem services, so it includes all the different uh, um, ecosystem services, climate change mitigation, uh, employment, uh, recreation services, fuel wood, all those things that those are, are very valuable to the people surrounding. But it, it, it does show how we can use those particular areas and avoid them being turned over to other uses and being denuded. So the reality for me is that nature tourism is incredibly valuable. And we're not talking here 
you and I going to Africa. In reality, India's got its own domestic market. It is huge, far bigger. 95% of people traveling in India now are Indians themselves. A huge domestic market, which is fantastic. So unlike Africa, where there's some disaster in Kenya, no one, everyone stops going. It doesn't have that problem. It's got its own market. That'll continue to go, continue to spend. But tourism is this, it's, it's not an intangible. Tourism for most of those people and most of those reserves gives them jobs, gives them a future, so they can stop grazing their cattle on the landscape, stop cutting down the trees. So to me, it's really important when you go there to, to, to consider all this in your, in your actions, and indeed the travel companies themselves to do the same. It is amazing when you look at the figures, and these are the most recent WWF figures associated with this fantastic industry of ours that we're all in and, and all use. It's actually a $400 billion per annum industry. But if anyone was to say, you know what, we're only going to invest $6.5 billion in that as, as governments, even though they make an extraordinary amount of money from it uh, as, as revenue and through jobs, most other industries would, cry, would, would cry with shame. They'd cry blue murder. This is, this is terrible. This is a very small investment in our protected areas. We need to do much better and encourage governments to do much better at investing. The reality in India is peanuts in terms of their own tiger reserves. Let me give you some examples. Just the 614 protected areas in India they each get 14,000 pounds a year to exist on. It's not a hell of a lot of money. We, it's not even minimum wages in this country per annum. The same again for all the central government funding for tiger reserves. 17.5 million, 47 tiger reserves across India. 39,000 square kilometers. Each one of those only gets the equivalent of a banker's salary to loan. So we do have to think of ways in which we as an industry, we as visitors, can do a hell of a lot better, as Colin has suggested. In fact, park fees already are accounting or tripling and doubling, uh, tripling and multiplying those figures quite substantially. So uh, we are doing better, and all those parks that do have tourism and are using those revenues more constructively are doing much better than all the tiger reserves that no one's ever heard of. So the reality is, could India do some of the things like Africa? Collins told me the one things we mustn't do, and he's damn right. But the reality is what we must copy is some of the examples of what's going on there, how to get more money into those protected areas. We need ways of combining communities. We need partnerships with communities and governments. We need all that. We are, there are ways, like here in the northern rangeland states of, uh, northern rangelands of Kenya, of combining all those communities together and to become stakeholders in conservation. Can we do the same in India? It's best illustrated with the Panchkana Corridor in Madhya Pradesh. Let's envisage a young tiger's journey from Pench to Kana. On the left of the Pench Reservoir, the forests have been restored by a private conservancy supporting its restoration, and the tiger reserve's borders now extend to the dam's right-hand banks. Crossing the state border, he moves from Maharashtra to Madhya Pradesh within a tiger reserve, a habitat that has rebounded in the last 20 years thanks to a large herbivore density, better security, with a vibrant nature tourism community. Next, he walks under the underpasses of a contentious motorway into the Rukard area, this once neglected buffer area, now managed by the tiger reserve. Visitors enjoy wild camping and walking. The next part of the corridor was a problem, but some carbon financing helped to expand the thin forest neck here. Our tiger now arrives into a landscape that was owned by the government's commercially run forest corporation, which large, with large teak plantations. But their forestry has been stopped, and the area has been restored by a community agreement that they now breed samba and spotted deer instead of cattle for release in other key forests.
This area, previously known for its insurgents and poaching activities, was targeted with greater government investment, creating more jobs and protection, and the expanding ecotourism industry resulted from the expansion of the buffer zones of Kana. So this forest has recovered, and our tigers finally feel safe through here. Before arriving into Kana, many farmers' fields have to be crossed. Farmers here are incentivized to leave pathways for wild animals and village guardians watch out for big cats. Finally, the young male arrives into Kana Tiger Reserve and finds a new home here. It's a challenge, but it's not an impossible vision. So that's really a, a vision for what could happen, and I say could. The reality is that all what I talked about there is within the laws of India. It's, it's, it's built into, into um, many of the, the sort of institutions, but no one's looking in the same visionary way that we need to do and to, to build those partnerships. And there are ways to do all of that. They've got the skills, the expertise, and indeed the monetary resources in India to do that. But I don't say everything in India, and people that have been to India and seen some of it, and some of it I don't like, and some of it you won't have liked. There's a terrible sort of building. There's a, there's a massive land grab going on all around the parks, stuff that we don't like. But the reality is, is they've got the laws. They've got the ability to stop a lot of it, but they've got you know, en enormous problems. We really need a, a roadmap to sustainability. We need l proper laws that are applied. We need monitoring. We've talked about our, our own uh, monitoring programs. We need incentives and partnerships with government, with the tourism industry, with communities, so they become stakeholders in the whole thing. Tourism isn't self-regulating. You know, it is a conservation tool, but it can be just, just the exact opposite if it doesn't have all those tools. But of course, it also needs good management. It needs good habitat, and it needs good protection. It cannot do any of this by itself. So I say to you, the answer is yes, yes, India can save the tigers. Nepal is saving the tigers. Bhutan's doing a fantastic job. And there are others in which Jeffrey's going to show you some of the slides and some of the wins and some of the losses that are going on. But yes, we can do. We just need a great deal of collaboration between all the stakeholders. And we can all do a lot more. I've, in fact, been trying to do a lot more over the last 10 years. And of course, Tough Tigers is really what I regard as a kind of bit like the Forest, forest Stewardship uh, Council. People might know it when they buy wood products or the Marine Stewardship Council. We're trying to use business-to-business -business pressure. Um, we have as our own kite marks. We have the Pug Audit. It's just been declared uh, a recognized certification by the Global Sustainable Tourism Council of the United Nations. So we're delighted about that. So you really now can buy uh, lodges uh, and providers, service providers who are recognizing the very best and, and giving us the kite marks to do that. So this becomes really, really important. We're also published good wildlife travel guides so that people know where to go on their next travels. We also do, um, we're starting to do village guardian schemes, trying to provide the sort of second protection force around those parks with people that are, are normally uh, chili farmers, continue to be chili farmers, but also become the eyes and ears of the park outside because a lot of the wildlife is still moving outside or moving from the park to the outside. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I'm going to let Jeffrey take over for the final talk. Thank you.